With the 12 Rules for Life series concluded, and a couple months to venture into non-Peterson waters, I set it to patron vote what book I'd be spending time with next. The decision was set up as a choice between a book about dicks or a book by a dick, and the majority have spoken. It is not yet time to talk about the cultural history of the penis, though that day will come, just not today. No, we are going to start a little journey with Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage. Yay. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel! And if you're new, hiya! I'm Cass. I have a cognitive psychology PhD and an apparent penchant for wanting to go through the references on books like this. Really quick, just to put it out there again, Cognitive psychology is one of the experimental branches of psychology, and I have zero training in counseling or clinical and am not any form of therapist. A fair number of trans YouTubers have responded to this book already, and we absolutely should listen to their experiences and their take on this. I wanted to add a scientific perspective on the claims being made and the research that Schreier talks about in this book. Given the YouTube algorithm's love of the content matter of this book and what we're going to be talking about in this video and the series, it probably has a snowball's chance in hell of staying monetized or possibly even being recommended by it. So if you're enjoying what you're seeing, maybe consider supporting me on Patreon. Yes, maybe. We do live streams and stuff. It's good times. Uh, if that's not your speed, you can always just leave a like, maybe even subscribe. Comment too. Those are all fun. I'm going to be following a similar format to what I used in my 12 Rules for Life series. So in direct book quotes, there may be citation needed flags that pop up occasionally indicating that I think a citation is warranted for whatever is being claimed. Also, this indicates I'm paraphrasing the book. This meaning I'm responding to the book, sharing my opinion, or integrating all of that with science. Either things Schreier has cited or references I'm bringing to the discussion. Alrighty, let's get this party started. A quick note before we begin. Print copies of this book are sold out. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, other online booksellers, local bookstores, all sold out. And thankfully ebooks are a thing, so I do have a copy, but the page numbers are being kind of screwy sometimes, so... Yeah. This book starts with a dedication, then a portion of Billy Joel's She's Always a Woman to Me. I see Schreier is appropriately setting the tone of the rest of the book here. The author's note helpfully clarifies. I take it for granted that teenagers are not quite adults. For the sake of clarity and honesty, I refer to biologically female teens caught up in this transgender craze as she and her. Transgender adults are a different matter. I refer to them by the names and pronouns they prefer wherever I can do so without causing confusion. And here's a strange feature of this book's logic. A trans adult, Schreier's totally fine using their pronouns and name. Trans youth, on the other hand, not so much. So do trans men spring fully formed from Zeus's forehead? Or perhaps the egg metaphor and nickname is more appropriate and literal than we'd realized. Absurdity aside, I'm not entirely sure where Schreier thinks trans men come from, and this will be more clear as we go through this video. I can see that this is to separate the true trans men who are legitimate in their transness from those poor little confused girls who will just latch on to any craze and don't really know any better. And uncharitably, it would seem that one has to earn the right to use their pronouns through trips around the sun. And since Schreier's cards are basically laid out here on the table, may as well lay mine out too. Trans adults don't come from nowhere. In nearly every story that I've heard from a trans person, the feeling that there is something off or different about their body starts young. As a cis tomboy woman elder millennial, my first exposure to any sort of transness came from Rocky Horror Picture Show, Eddie Izzard, whom we stand and total honesty and going to disregard the shitty takes, just this is one of the first things that I encountered, 
Buck Angel from an episode of HBO's Real Sex. I first saw Rocky Horror in fifth grade, although it was the edited for TV version they showed on Fox around Halloween, so I uh, saw the full version in high school, as well as being introduced to Eddie Izzard by a friend, dressed to kill if you're curious, and probably around the same time, maybe a little later, saw the Real Sex episode with Buck Angel in it. I don't know how informed other people my age were of trans people or the transgender identity. Up until the Buck Angel episode where it was sort of laid out more clearly what trans meant, my young and uninformed ass thought it was more like the old trope of men wearing women's clothing as a personality quirk. I mean, we had Frank Inferter, who was a sweet transvestite from Transylvania, and in Dress to Kill, Eddie described herself as an executive transvestite, so that was sort of the lingo that I had, and a transgender identity just wasn't even on my radar. My point here is that this millennial didn't have the conceptual language, or concept even really, to talk about a transgender identity. But that's changed. It seems that most Americans are at least familiar with the word transgender, if not some understanding of what it means, kind of the whole bathroom politics and the existence of this book would suggest that there's a ways to go for actual understanding, but it's a start. Kids having the language to express how they're feeling at whatever age isn't a bad thing and not forcing them to go through a double body horror experience of puberty. So the regular body horror of just puberty, plus going through it in what feels to be the wrong gender, not making them do that, making them not have to hide part of their identity in shame or fear, not hating themselves for part of who they are. Oh, but we are just in the author's note. There will be time to talk about people's experience and the research later. I'll just say that it's fucked up to categorically decide that trans boys are just following a trend and, as such, will be deliberately misgendered throughout the course of this book. But hey, Schreier was clear in her language and intent, so it could be worse. Then there's the note that names and details have been changed so that the battle-worn parents can't be called out by their kids. Finally, there's the assurance that if someone recognizes themselves in one of the stories, it's not them. Just, the stories are all so similar due to the nature of the contagion, they all kind of sound the same. I'm not sure when the trend of having an introductory chapter that's basically the preface, but not called such, started. My collection of books here all have a preface if they don't just launch into the book proper but 12 Rules had its overture, and this has its introduction. The full title of this chapter is Introduction, The Contagion. Contagion. We start out this book by hearing about Lucy, described to Schreier by their mother as a girly girl. Jumping in to say that for the trans people talked about in this book, we're going to default to gender-neutral language. Schreier practically calls them trenders, but they're included in this book because they've identified as trans. And because I don't know how they would like to be referred to, we're going to use they, them, their sort of language. Evidence of the girliness includes things like playing dress up or just dressing up in general, having beanie babies and pets, and having favorite movies like The Little Mermaid and later on Twilight. That these two movies include protagonists who, as part of their character motivation, want to transform into something else, isn't noted or commented on by Schreier. And it's a little more funny than that because both those characters want to turn into something else, either a human or a vampire. This decision was fought against by their family and friends, and ultimately they succeeded and were happier for it. Lucy. You know what? No, fuck it. I don't want to come close to dead naming or dead gendering somebody. L was described as doing well in school, but having trouble with depression and anxiety. L's affluent parents, mom was a prominent Southern attorney, took them to psychiatrists and therapists for treatment and medication, 
but no amount of talk therapy or drugs leveled their social obstacles. The cliques that didn't want them, their nervous tendency to flub social tests casually administered by other girls. Elle had guy friends and boyfriends in high school, but never succeeded at having friends who were girls. Elle's older brother fell into drug addiction of unspecified type, and at some point Elle was diagnosed with bipolar type 2. Okay, so longtime viewers of the channel know that I too was hit by the bipolar stick, and I also had an easier time making friends with the guys. Elle's story here is building to the core argument of the book, but I just wanted to point out that these problems aren't all that uncommon. Roughly a quarter of the US population will deal with a psych disorder of some form in any given year, and having trouble with friends in high school is practically part of the high school experience, especially if you do have a psych disorder. These are things to keep an eye on as a responsible parent, but it doesn't mean that your kid's fated to fall into whatever trend happens to be popular or be radicalized down some rabbit hole. It can happen, and that's why you should hopefully have a good communicative and trusting relationship with your kid that's been built since childhood, but it doesn't mean it's guaranteed to happen. But tied in with this is the implication that Elle was essentially set up into being manipulated into identifying as something that they aren't, not really. And that is the crux of this book. Moving on. Elle's liberal arts college is pinpointed as the first step in Elle taking on a trans identity because they had the opportunity to state their name, orientation, and pronouns. And as the school year kicked off, their anxiety flared up. So? They decided, with several of their friends, that their angst had a fashionable cause. Gender dysphoria. Within a year, Elle had begun a course of testosterone, but their real drug, the one that hooked them, was the promise of a new identity. A shaved head, boys' clothes, and a new name formed the baptismal waters of a female-to-male rebirth. Schreier says that top surgery is Elle's next step, and if you're not familiar, top surgery is basically a breast reduction. This is gonna be a fun book. I can tell already. Would these friends have maybe belonged to an LGBT group on campus that Elle joined because they felt like they belonged there? Maybe. Unless Elle was getting black market testosterone, which I'm not saying doesn't happen, especially when the legal pathways are blocked, but this testosterone use would have been signed off by at least some form of healthcare practitioner. So, and if you pull out this quote from the book's context, yeah, a person who is experiencing gender dysphoria will probably socially transition, possibly pursue hormone therapy, other surgeries if they want, and try to live in the gender appropriate for them. That's kind of the point. And also, Elle's an adult. Schreier asked Elle's mom how she was sure Elle wasn't dysphoric. They'd never shown anything like that. Elle's mom never heard Elle say that they were uncomfortable with their body. A pixie cut picked by the mom when Elle was five made Elle cry because they looked like a boy, and Elle dated boys. This video won't have a cat in the thumbnail or in the title, so we should be okay, but just in case. Mom, if you're watching this, turn it off. Just turn it off as a favor to me. Okay. Parents don't necessarily know everything that their kid is thinking or that they get up to. Huge caveat that this is coming from a different context because I wasn't hiding parts of my identity from my mom, but I certainly wasn't being totally upfront with her either, because I couldn't be. Before getting into any of this, I just want to clarify that the relationship I have now with my mom is good. It took some work to get here some years ago, but we're cool. It's good. It's fine. Okay, so here it goes. I never talked about my discomfort with my body with my mom because I would either be just outright shut down, there is no problem, stop talking about it, or invalidated by her own body image problems. Starting in middle school, my mom wasn't really kept in the loop on my friend group situation and the goings on there. And she did hear about my first date, but that was partially because I was just so excited to be going on a date. And also I needed to justify where I was going and the money. 
she doesn't know when I became sexually active. And when I told her that I was getting an apartment with Dr. Mr. Then the boyfriend, now the husband, as a courtesy, she flipped her shit. There was a lot of no daughter of mine and living in sin and just a whole scene made in the restaurant that night. Because, yeah, I told her in public thinking it might rein things in. It didn't. So all this talk of boundaries from the 12 Rules series is coming from lived experience, dear viewer. So forgive me if I'm not willing to take Elle's mom as the ultimate expert on their kid, even if she is a prominent Southern attorney. Schreier then reiterates that this book isn't about trans adults, and that she spoke to many trans adults who indicated that the discomfort they felt with their body was there for most of their lives. Their dysphoria certainly never made them popular. More often than not, it was a source of unease and embarrassment. Growing up, none of them knew a single other trans person, and the internet did not yet exist to supply mentors. But they didn't want or need mentors. They knew how they felt. <laughs> Presenting as the opposite sex simply makes them more comfortable. They do not seek to be celebrated for the life they have chosen. They want to pass, and in many cases, to be left alone. Okay, but maybe these people's gender dysphoria may have been less embarrassing if there had been more awareness of transgender identities when they were younger. Having some concrete interviews to point to for these people's experience would be useful. I'd be interested to know if they really wouldn't have wanted someone to help them along the way, possibly providing verbiage or understanding for what they were going through. Going back to my mood disorder for a sec, I think part of why I've been able to cope with it and not be just blindsided by it is because when it really started to kick up in earnest, my dad was there for me with a similar experience. To be able to tell me that it wasn't just me experiencing these things, that it wasn't my fault. I just find it hard to believe that Schreier talked to a representative sample of adult trans people and that every person she spoke to really would have preferred to reinvent the transgender wheel and go it alone. Schreier then clarifies that the trans people she spoke to are not at fault for the current trans epidemic plaguing teenage girls. No, no. Apparently that is more akin to other things. The Salem witch trials of the 17th century are closer to the mark. So are the nervous disorders of the 18th century and the neurasthenia epidemic of the 19th century. Anorexia nervosa, repressed memory, bulimia, and the cutting contagion in the 20th. One protagonist has led them all, notorious for magnifying and spreading her own psychic pain, the adolescent girl. Her distress is real, but her self-diagnosis in each case is flawed, more the result of encouragement and suggestion than psychological necessity. Starting with the references. Reference 1 is a piece talking about the mostly historical condition of neurasthenia. Symptoms ranged from things like headache, pain, or weight loss, up to anxiety or depression. It was thought this was due to using up your nervous energy in more modern pursuits. William James, father of American psychology, called it Americanitis, because America, fuck yeah. Perhaps not surprisingly, there's a bit of racism, classism, and misogyny built into this. So the well-off white Anglo-Saxon Protestant would get this diagnosis, but not the Catholics or people of color or those in the lower classes. The treatment for this varied by gender. So men, it was to go off and do manly things like cattle ranching, a la Teddy Roosevelt. For women, it was bed rest and lots of it, like four to six weeks of it, not even getting to feed yourself. And this is inspiration for the yellow wallpaper. I don't know if I'd call neurasthenia an epidemic. It was a faddish diagnosis that ultimately was found to not have solid empirical grounding. And perhaps if that was the context Schreier had included this in, it would have hit our argument better. Claiming the same things happening with transgender kids? That's a different matter, but that's a bridge to be crossed later on. Schreier doesn't provide a reference for the nervous disorders, but given the time period, it's probably reasonable to assume she's talking about hysteria. Super historically, this was blamed on a wandering uterus. Seriously. And then eventually it became a sort of catch-all for women be crazy before being morphed and divided into things resembling the modern psychological disorders. At the period of time she's talking about, this diagnosis would probably be given to a woman who is not conforming to the social norms 
or experiencing things that we would call depression or anxiety. Recommended treatment? A postmarital digging. And I'm sure that was the official lingo of the time. You can dress me. I am a doctor after all. Wrong type. Shh. Okay. Hysteria was a problematic diagnosis for sure, but linking it to trans boys? Reference two is the book Crazy Like Us, The Globalization of the American Psyche. I can't get my hands on the book in time, but I dug up the abstract and a book review. This proposes that in addition to mass exporting our media, we, meaning Americans, are also sending out not only the way we treat psych disorders, but the disorders themselves. This is something I touched on in the psychiatry videos. For something to be considered disordered behavior, it needs to violate the societal or cultural norms that that person's living in. So in the US, hearing voices isn't seen as part of normal experience. And so if you are hearing voices, it might indicate that you're experiencing schizophrenia or some other related disorder. In other cultures, hearing voices might be part of a religious experience or spiritual experience of some form, and as such, wouldn't be seen as disordered. So that's one facet this book's talking about. Another is cultures or locations or whatever coming down with American disorders that weren't experienced there beforehand. And the example from the abstract and the book review is anorexia nervosa in Hong Kong. Final theme I'll mention is that our method of treating psychological disorders might not be the best fit for other cultures, and so we need to be mindful and respectful of that. Book sounds interesting. It seems it's attached to the anorexia mentioned because of the spread between cultures. Okay. Reference 3 is a 300-page book that's available online. This is a book by a psychiatrist detailing the recovered memory issue. This topic is actually the next patron topic pick that I didn't have the heart to work on over the holidays. Briefly, recovered memories are a contentious issue. So the idea is that these are memories that are buried out of your conscious awareness deep down in your unconscious as a defense mechanism due to their traumatic nature. But they don't stay buried, they kind of interfere with things and might give you things like anxiety or depression, at which point you see a therapist who, through certain techniques, can help you recover that memory so that you can begin to deal with it and heal from it. However, it's been suggested that these memories are iatrogenic in nature. Iatrogenic roughly translating to being put there by the doctor. Said slightly differently, research has demonstrated that we can implant false memories in people especially when using techniques similar to those used by doctors or therapists who subscribe to this theory. This book is warning against using these sorts of techniques, indicating that in addition to creating false memories, they might give rise to dissociative identity disorder. And if that name isn't ringing a bell, you might know it as multiple personality disorder. I agree. The research indicates that we can implant false memories in people that feel as real as actual memories. And this was and is something that caused a lot of grief for far too many people. However, I vehemently disagree that the people who recover memories would be the same population as the trans but not really youth that Schreier's arguing for in this book. I can see the possibility that there is some sliver of overlap between these populations, but there's no reason to think that these two are linked, that all trans boys would be susceptible to recovering false memories, or even that the susceptibility or vulnerability to recovering false memories and being a trans boy is somehow coming from the same root cause. Reference 4 is a piece from Salon.com about cutting and other forms of self-harm. To skip this portion of the video, jump to the timestamp on screen. It takes the form of an interview with a sociology professor who co-wrote the book The Tender Cut. The professor argues that self-harm shifted from a psychological disorder to a sociological phenomenon. That because of its portrayal in the media as a way to deal with psychological pain, it became a more normal way to cope with those negative feelings and also to bond with others going through similar situations. I'm a bit torn on this perspective. On the one hand, my personal experience would suggest that I did pick this up from the media. Sort of. Panded casts over sharing time. Self-harm is something that I've occasionally done as a coping thing. We'll skip over the specifics, but my inspiration came from the abyss. The nerdiness never stops, I know. But one military character at one point is suffering from high-pressure nervous syndrome and is shown cutting himself to 
try to deal with it. When my mood disorder really kicked into overdrive, I remembered that scene and tried it. And that it's something that I used, like when my grad school situation turned really bad, would suggest the utility I see in doing it in a particularly bad mindset. So my personal experience was shaped by a movie that was not trendy amongst the youth of my day, but a movie nonetheless. And it's also possible that I would have tried it without the movie or found inspiration elsewhere. On the other, there's a lot to be said about self-harm outside of a sociological perspective. For one, there's an elevated suicide risk for those who self-harm. And as such, I don't think we should normalize or almost trivialize this as part of normal youth experience like I think the Salon article kind of did. Second, self-harm, for most people, isn't a light undertaking. It's done when feeling extreme duress. Third, though, it does seem to be a sort of contagious behavior that social media has amplified. So I'm not entirely fine with the Salon piece, but bringing this back to the book, it does seem that girls are more likely to self-harm than boys, and this has increased with the rise of social media. But it's a logical leap to go from girls are more likely to self-harm to girls are identifying as trans when they're not. At time of recording, I've only skimmed the rest of the book, so I don't know if this is an argument that's actually made, but it occurred to me when reading this that a possible subtext interpretation of this and the next quote is that a girl taking on a trans identity is a form of self-harm. And I'm not sure if this is Schreier's intended meaning here or not, but her asserting that these two populations are the same certainly opens the door to that possible interpretation. Especially with her repeated sort of scaremongering with the top surgery as the next step for Elle and other people. The last of these references, five, is a post in Psychology Today. Before talking about the post itself, let's talk a little about Psychology Today. This is not a peer-reviewed journal. It's more a collection of blogs than a scholarly work. And they're about, it says they are a live stream of what's happening in Psychology Today. Some writers are more diligent about building empirical support for their posts, others less so. This is on the less so end. This post by the sociologist Robert Bartholomew argues that mass hysteria tends to be more of a female thing to experience, and that he has loads of examples of it that he doesn't provide any sort of citations for. Always a compelling argument for me. Digging around a little, I found something suggesting that certain personality traits may play a role in susceptibility to mass hysteria, but it noted that consistent patterns are hard to find. The Psychology Today post talks mostly about adults, only bringing girls into the discussion at the very end. Specifically, that girls in Africa or Asia may experience an outbreak where they fight, verbally or physically, with school officials to demand change. So in the context of this post, it isn't about these girls' angst so much as a way to get their voices heard in a culture where they aren't really allowed to. Reference 5, then, in brief, various forms of nope. With that long, but productive reference discussion done, let's talk about this quote. There's just so much wrong here. The one part I won't disagree with is that in the cases of hysteria, neurasthenia, eating disorders, recovered memories, and cutting, there is genuine suffering and distress. However, to say that these are all self-diagnosed is patently absurd. Hysteria would be a label practically slapped on the person. Neurasthenia may have been sought out as a diagnosis because of its association with affluence. Recovered memories is a can of worms we are not going into today. But eating disorders and self-harm? Either you're doing the behaviors or you're not. And yeah, there is some wiggle room with the eating disorders because of the different way it can show up between different people, but bottom line, either you're having the associated feelings, thoughts, and behaviors, or you're not. It's almost like she's implying that these kids are somehow faking the disorder by showing the behaviors and thoughts and whatever, but not really having those. Which I guess is the heart of the end of this quote that this youth isn't doing any of the listed things because they really have a disorder, this so-called psychological necessity, but because of external forces driving them to do so. Gross. Three decades ago, these girls might have hankered for liposuction while their physical forms wasted away. 
Two decades ago, today's trans-identified teens might have discovered a repressed memory of childhood trauma. Today's diagnostic craze isn't demonic possession, it's gender dysphoria, and its cure is not exorcism, laxatives, or purging. It's testosterone and top surgery. Oh, well, the positive here is Schreier isn't leaving herself any room for interpretation. No, that's not what I meant ice cream for her. Does she think people aren't still getting eating disorders? Or is her argument that this subset of the population don't have a true eating disorder? And maybe she isn't aware, but there are still therapists and counselors willing to do the therapeutic practices associated with recovered memories. It's not a practice that died off. But going back to something I said earlier, there may be some overlap in the population between trans boys and people who recover memories, develop an eating disorder, whatever else. But that doesn't mean that trans boys are identifying as trans because it's trendy. Huge false equivalence there, Chief. Pivot to Schreier saying, unsurprisingly, that the First Amendment is her favorite. In October 2017, my own state, California, enacted a law that threatened jail time for healthcare workers who refused to use patients' requested gender pronouns. New York had adopted a similar law, which applied to employers, landlords, and business owners. Both laws are facially and thoroughly unconstitutional. The First Amendment has long protected the right to say unpopular things without government interference. It also guarantees our right to refuse to say the things the government wants said. Reference 6 is a Fox News piece about a bill to protect senior LGBT patients' rights in different care facilities. The piece includes that a person willfully using the wrong pronouns would be met with a fine, whereas criminal charges would be reserved for acts that put the patient at risk. I'm not seeing anything beyond speculation about jail time for misgendering the person. Oh, for fuck's sake. And before similar arguments to Canadian Bill C-16 from the Lobsters, I'm calling it now. Reference 7 is a sort of opinion piece from the Washington Post by a lawyer and adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute about the thing described in the quote. I say sort of because this sounds almost like an invited op-ed, where they are seeking different perspectives on a topic. The link to the NYC website's dead, but other websites did have some info and it's more of the same. You have to go out of your way to willfully and intentionally use the wrong name or pronouns for a person for this to come into play. Schreier points to a Supreme Court case from 1943 that decided that students don't have to salute the flag. As such, the government can't make people say things. Ah yes, the compelled speech argument once again. Yay. Schreier's inclusion of this was probably to set up how she got in contact with Elle's mom initially, but I can't deny that it's also beating the not wanting to use trans people's pronouns drum too. Because it's an aside, we're not going to spend a lot of time here. But I will throw in that. First, the consequences of not using a trans person's pronouns tends to cap at a fine for the severity of punishment. And to do that, you have to really not want to respect that person's request. Bad. Second, the context for these bills and laws tend to be pretty specific. The government, or people acting for the government, employers, landlords, and so forth. Third, these are typically added to existing non-discrimination laws. Final comment here. It's interesting, strange, something that Schreier has repeatedly emphasized that she is down with the adult trans people living their life, living their truth, you know, civil rights, yay, but then is against these anti-discrimination acts. Moving on. Schreier wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal about these laws and as a consequence was contacted by Elle's mom though the story changes ever so slightly now. Elle's mother saw my piece and found something in it. Hope. She contacted me under a pseudonym and asked me to write about her child, who had announced during adolescence that they were transgender, despite never having shown any signs of gender dysphoria in their youth. She said Elle had discovered this identity with the help of the internet, which provides an endless array of transgender mentors who coach adolescents in the art of slipping into a new gender identity what to wear, how to walk, what to say. Which internet companies sell the best breast binders? A breast compression garment worn under clothes. Which organizations send them for free and guarantee discreet packaging so that parents never find out? How to persuade doctors to supply the hormones you want? 
how to deceive parents, or if they resist your new identity, how to break away entirely. The possibility isn't entertained that Elle found the language to describe their experience through the internet or going away to college. That these sorts of communities pop up when there isn't the needed support at home. That these knowledge bases get shared because jumping through the familial or medical hoops isn't hard enough as it is. That these kids are having to do this all in such secrecy isn't addressed here. Although I guess I shouldn't be terribly surprised. To be blunt, the type of parent who would be in hardcore denial that their kid is trans, and possibly the target audience of this book, is exactly the type of parent that you would have to hide this sort of information from. Deceiving parents in one frame, or one context, hiding your truth in another. Elle's mother blames testosterone and a general rebellious acting out as the root cause behind their new churlish and aggressive behavior. As is described in the book, apparently Elle refused to answer questions about their trans identity, called their mother a transphobe, and Elle's manufactured story of having always known they were different and having always been trans, their mother later discovered, had been lifted verbatim from the internet. I would be very interested to hear Elle's side of the story here. Based on my own experiences, I would guess, and again, I can't emphasize this enough that this is a guess, that either Elle was just questioned about what was going on, or the changes were enough that Elle was questioned what was going on, finally opened up and was met with the you can't be trans and the list of why nots from the start of this chapter. After being shut down, Elle may have been perceived to be churlish by their mom because your lived experience and truth being denied by a parent is hard to take with a cheerful attitude. If the mom's questions were more along the lines of an interrogation of who did this to them, I could see not wanting to continue the discussion further. Using the basic explanation of they've always been trans doesn't invalidate it. Sometimes there's only so many different ways to say a basic piece of information especially when you're trying to convey information to a brick wall in the form of a mother who knows best. But wait, there's more. In their new, highly combustible state, Elle would fly into rage if their parents used their legal name, the one they had given them, or failed to use their new pronouns. In short order, their parents hardly recognized them. They became alarmed by Elle's sudden thrall to a gender ideology that seemed, well, a lot of mumbo jumbo, biologically speaking. Their mother said it seemed as though Elle had joined a cult. She feared it might never release her child. I mentioned earlier that my mom was not pleased I was moving in with my boyfriend in college. I promise this is relevant. In the lead up to the move-in, there was some tension. Goalposts and requirements that she thought were impossible for me to meet were set. When those were met and passed, they were moved further downfield. Financial help was threatened to be withdrawn, and I was pretty much independent at that point, so it was an empty threat. Not being welcome back home ever to see her again or the pets was tabled for a time, but I stuck to my guns. But all this was the negative influence of Dr. Mr. The Boyfriend Now Husband. Surely her innocent little baby couldn't be wanting to do all of this of her own volition. No, I had to have been corrupted. I bring this up again because I feel for Elle here. Every ounce of ownership my mom felt she had over me was used against me, and I was just trying to move in with my boyfriend. There were huge fights about where I was going, who I was spending time with, and so forth. Unsurprisingly, I was spending less and less time at her house. So the second that my goals and requirements were met, I was gone. I was fully aware that I might never go home again, and it didn't matter that we didn't have the apartment yet. I was not continuing to live under her roof. And in the lead up to that, I remember hearing similar sentiments to what Elle's mom is saying here, just in a different context. I was a new, unrecognizable person, versus I was getting my first actual taste of freedom. I was flying off the handle easy and so angry all the time. I was constantly provoked. I was being unduly influenced by Dr. Mr. The Boyfriend. He was helping me out of a bad situation with what I wanted to do. So yeah, I would love to hear Elle's side of things. 
Specific to this comment is that this may have seemed sudden to Elle's parents, but it almost certainly wasn't sudden to Elle. And on top of that, Elle may have been dropping hints beforehand that were either unseen or unacknowledged. Schreier provides a definition of gender dysphoria as being characterized by severe and persistent discomfort in one's biological sex. She says it tends to start around two to four years of age, then possibly gets worse with puberty. She notes that it'll resolve for about 70% of cases. Also, she says that this has tended to afflict a small portion of the population, hundredth of a percent, predominantly boys. Finally, Schreier claims that prior to 2012, there was no literature on gender dysphoria in assigned female at birth youth. Reference 8 is the fourth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. If you're rusty on that, it's typically referred to as the DSM, and it's essentially the Psychiatrist Diagnostic Handbook. I have a video that goes through it and its history in more detail here-ish, but I want to point out that we are currently on the fifth edition. Now, I don't know why Schreier chose to cite the 4th edition instead of the 5th. It may be that she just had easy access to the 4th and not the 5th. But there was a pretty substantial overhaul regarding gender dysphoria in the 5th edition. Reference 9 is a response to another paper, so let's start with the precipitating paper. This paper basically called into question the percentage of trans youth who stopped identifying as trans when they got older in part because of the way this figure has been used to try and discourage a social transition for kids. The authors also urged listening to the youth about their gender identity and to focus on how to support them as they matured rather than trying to dictate how their gender should develop. Reference 9 was a response to that paper written by one of the people whose work had been criticized. This paper counter-argued with most of the methods or findings of the critical paper. The author also indicated a history of beef with the critical paper's authors. So here's where I'm at as somebody who's not in this field. We don't have a lot of longitudinal data yet on this. The idea of kids socially transitioning is still pretty new. On the one hand is somebody who is horribly pedantic in their response, willing to bring professional drama into a published article, and wrote a glowing review for this book. On the other is a team of researchers who are arguing that practitioners listen to what the kids want and need, and arguing that maybe we change some of the kind of negative terminology used. I certainly encourage you to read the back and forth between these papers and come to your own conclusions, but I'm going to hold off on calling this 70 to 80% figure definitive. As far as general proportion, in the US, for adults, it's currently sitting at 0.6% of the population identify as trans. Although I wouldn't be surprised to see that number grow a little bit as gender roles become less defined, people become more comfortable with a trans or non-binary identity, and so forth. And if it's 0.6% of the adult population, I would expect to see a number close to that for pre-adults, so this hundredth of a percent seems low. With regard to her claim for the lack of literature prior to 2012 for assigned female at birth trans youth, Looking at the references cited by the paper that Reference 9 was responding to, there wasn't exactly a lot of literature out there for trans youth in general prior to the mid-2000s. Schreier says there's been a change in the last 10 years or so where kids in the West are self-identifying as transgender and experiencing gender dysphoria. Additionally, AFAB kids are becoming the majority of cases, which is worrying to her. Reference 10 is a paper about the shift over time in the gender of referred clients to the UK Gender Identity Service. As shown in Figure 1, they did shift in more AFAB teens being referred in for services in more recent years. The authors speculate this could be due to more trans boys being worried about going through puberty in their birth sex, it possibly being easier and more accepted for trans boys to come out than trans girls, or with the rise in social media, trans boys feeling like they don't fit the feminine stereotype and therefore seeking help. This is not my area of expertise, so if the experts are not alarmed so much as, hey, there's this trend happening, we probably should try to figure this out, I'm not inclined to be alarmed myself. Schreier says since she is an opinion writer, not an investigative reporter, she passed the story along to a colleague, but couldn't get it out of her head. 
So she got back in contact with Elle's mom, then spoke to a whole bunch of different people of varying specializations and experiences, ranging from medical doctors to detransitioners. And all of this made her intensely curious what's ailing these girls. I can only hope that some form of concrete source will be provided for these gender dysphoria experts she spoke to, but this is just the introduction. This culminated in another opinion piece for the Wall Street Journal in 2019. This was met with a lot of engagement, including a counter-response piece by Jennifer Finney Boylan, published in the New York Times, which also found a lot of engagement. Okay, so Schreier's piece feels like the condensed version of this book. Some parts are even verbatim. Something we'll get into later on in the book is rapid onset gender dysphoria, but some tentative research into that brought up Blanchard and autogynephilia, so that'll be fun. Boylan's piece countered from a couple different ways. Her personal experience as a trans woman, her child coming out to her as trans, as well as critiquing the research supporting rapid onset gender dysphoria. Schreier received emails from parents who had similar experiences to Elle's mom, as well as being attacked by transgender activists online. She said she tried to get the stories of anyone who contacted her, positively or negatively, and set up a Tumblr and Instagram account for people to send those stories through. And those stories make up the core of this book. This may well be another instance of me missing something that's completely obvious just staring me in the face, but I'm not able to find these conversations over Tumblr or Instagram. And I'm not a Tumblr-er, so I could easily be missing something there. But Schreier's Instagram is private at this point, so if anybody can point me to an archive of these discussions, that would be very much appreciated. Ready for some good old-fashioned pearl clutching? This is a story Americans need to hear. Whether or not you have an adolescent daughter, whether or not your child has fallen for this transgender craze, America has become fertile ground for this mass enthusiasm for reasons that have everything to do with our cultural frailty. Parents are undermined, experts are over-relied upon, dissenters in science and medicine are intimidated, free speech truckles under renewed attack, government healthcare laws harbor hidden consequences, and an intersectional era has arisen in which the desire to escape a dominant identity encourages individuals to take cover in victim groups. Here we go with progressive politics leading to the downfall of our once proud and noble culture, yet again. Although Schreier's writing style does almost make me miss the somewhat purple prose of Peterson. But dragons, which do exist, perhaps more than anything else exists, also hoard gold. Almost. This might be more alarming if so much of this hadn't been part of the moral panic since there has been morals to panic. I think these points will be touched on as we go through the book, so more, much, much more on these later. Although, if you could do me a solid, Schreier, and change your stance on the importance of experts, at least until we're over this pandemic, if not working on the whole environment thing, that'd be great. Thanks. Schreier indicates that she did roughly 200 interviews and spoke to over four dozen families of adolescents. And she justifies the use of parental descriptions of their child's behavior because the discomfort associated with gender dysphoria should be easy and obvious for the parents to spot. I've talked around this, so let's just say it more plainly. My mom had body image problems for pretty much my entire life, if not before then. So I learned very early on not to broach the subject. Her weight was always a touchy subject growing up. So much so that when I had to draw a picture of our family at the end of first grade, I knew I was screwed. If I drew her realistically, I knew my dad would be on the receiving end of something awful when that picture got home. If I didn't and drew her skinny, I knew that there was a possibility that my dad would still be on the receiving end of some badness, plus whatever reaction I'd get from one of the teachers I liked the least. But that's what I did. Swallowed my pride, endured the are you blind or just dumb look from that teacher, but drew my happy little stick family. Dad tallest, me shortest, mom in the middle, all with matching rectangle bodies. Crisis averted. And that was first grade. Imagine how refined that got by the time I was an adolescent. My dad knew about my unhappiness with how I looked, 
because I could talk to him about it without it turning into a thing. Flip side of that is things like, to this day, my mom saying she wished I'd never been diagnosed with depression in middle school because it isn't really that bad. So if there's families in this interview pool of Schreier's where the kid has learned not to let on that there's any discomfort or even to talk about this, of course the parents are going to say that everything was fine until their kid came out as trans. Oh, reference 11 is the American Psychiatric Association's website for gender dysphoria. It goes into more depth than Schreier's included persistent, insistent, and consistent sense of a child's discomfort in his body. It does note that not all trans people experience gender dysphoria, but I'm sure that won't be a potential issue down the book road. Schreier does concede that the parents may not know everything about their kids' lives and experiences, but that they should be able to at least indicate how the kid's doing in general. A parent who is pretty out of their kid's loop should still be able to indicate if they graduated high school or not, or other sort of more objective things. But questions like, are they building toward a future with a romantic partner, is pretty open to interpretation, especially if the parents don't approve of that romantic partner. Did I mention that my mom didn't like Dr. Mr. The Boyfriend until we were practically married? I don't have to guess how she would have answered that sort of question. I was told. She adores him now, though. Schreier tries to make the case that this book is not speaking to the transgender experience and that the stories of the trans people she spoke to should be shared. They're doing great things for civil rights. You know, yay trans people. It's instead focusing on the purported contagious phenomenon afflicting teenage girls. It originates not in traditional gender dysphoria, but in videos found on the internet. It represents mimicry inspired by internet gurus, a pledge taken with girlfriends, hands and breath held, eyes squeezed shut. For these girls, trans identification offers freedom from anxiety's relentless pursuit. It satisfies the deepest need for acceptance, the thrill of transgression, the seductive lilt of belonging. As indicated before, I'm not trans, so I don't have any form of this experience. But I have listened to trans people share theirs. My understanding is that for most people, being trans doesn't really relieve any anxiety. If anything, it just is a source of it until you can get the outer world to match your inner world at least the best that you can. So this argument that trans boys are doing this as a way to relieve anxiety doesn't really make sense in the way that she's arguing. And for the trans boys who didn't really feel like they fit in with the girls or the boys, Finding other people like yourself could finally give you a sense of acceptance and belonging. Teasing something that will come up in a later chapter, Schreier says that one trans youth she spoke to said he found the courage to come out as trans because of the YouTuber Chase Ross. Chapter 3 should be... enlightening. I feel like I'm getting something different out of this quote than Schreier did. Getting the courage to come out as trans is not equivalent to deciding they are trans. Being trans is kind of baked into the decision of coming out. To wrap up this chapter, Schreier says that this all encapsulates the American family experience now at odds with the progressive society, and that these trans boys are only trans because of external forces, including, apparently, radical gender ideology taught in school. Some small proportion of the population will always be transgender. But perhaps the current craze will not always lure troubled young girls with no history of gender dysphoria, enlisting them in a lifetime of hormone dependency and disfiguring surgeries. If this is a social contagion, society, perhaps, can arrest it. No adolescent should pay this high a price for having been, briefly, a follower. I guess we'll see how well Schreier establishes this as a legitimate fad as the book progresses. Right now, I'm wanting something that points me to a lack of dysphoria in these kids' histories, other than the parents saying so. Not that gender dysphoria is a requirement for being trans. And that is it for Irreversible Damages Introduction. If you are edutained, leave a like, maybe subscribe, yes. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, Discord, or Patreon. Links for all of those are in the description box. And yeah, see you guys next time. Bye! Bye.